How's it going out there? It's November 11th, and I'm Frank Curzio, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, where I break the headlines and uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. Man, so much going on. Election not conceded yet. We have a new vaccine from Pfizer, over 90% effective, COVID-19, which has resulted in huge whipsaws in the market, right? I mean, you're looking at rotations, really. And the SP 500, the, the, the Dow, not really a reflection of what's actually going on, right? I mean, the Dow is just a price way to index. It's, you know, great if you're in there. It's not a big deal in terms of, of being a barometer of the markets. And then you have the SP 500, where the top five companies represent, what, 22, 23% of the total index. But looking within the SP 500, the individual sectors, what's going on? The rotation out of momentum, out of big tech into cyclicals like travel. Airlines, cruises, oil stocks, banks should sound pretty familiar to you. I'll break down a lot of that later. We're going to start things off a little different today. I'm going to read a letter to you that was sent to me from a very special person. It says, Dear Frank, my name is Anthony, and I'm a Master Chief of the United States Navy with 19 years of faithful service. I am a hovercraft pilot, aka craftsmaster, and Navy rescue swimmer. The hovercraft gig is pretty funny. Flying around the ocean at 50 plus knots sideways is always a good day. I've been listening to you for some years now, and I'm a subscriber to a few of your products. I love them all. Anyway, my reason for writing you is mainly to say thanks. You personally have made a difference out there in Japan for quite a few people. You have taught and advised me in the investing world, which in turn I've used to educate my sailors. So for that, a huge thanks to you and your team at Curzio Research. I'm a self-taught analyst, as well I try to be, I was forcing myself to learn or to educate my sailors has become a mission of mine. I truly wish there was somebody in my corner doing the same thing for me when I was younger and coming up through the ranks. These kids throw money at stocks without any idea to why it's a good buy or not. Most would come to me after suffering losses, and when I posed the question, why did you buy this, the common answer was, they thought it was going up. Then I asked the second question, why was it going up? And that's where the pause and hesitation came. They didn't have a clue as to why... They were doing what they were doing. This is what motivated me to learn more. Over the years, we have started an investor club group that has only continued to grow. feels good to hear the same folks talk about some key ratios, earnings, financial status, etc. I'm sure you get to the point. Now, they're actually capable of going back and forth on why a stock is a good buy or not. Knowing that I've inspired these sailors and Marines is quite a good feeling. Watching these guys grow is amazing, and they're smart as heck. This is all a direct result of you. The way you tell it, the way you keep it real, the lessons, the advice, the list goes on. Honestly, I'm just a dumb dude who grew up poor in the project of Boston and only joined the military to find a steady paycheck. I never look back. I've done pretty well for myself. Never in a million years did I think this is where I could be and what I'd be doing, but I love it. If you're reading this, then our token of appreciation has arrived. The paddle is a Navy tradition to give a sailor as a special thanks or to see them off as they transfer to another unit. To describe your paddle, there's a Craftsmaster breast insignia mounted on the top of the handle. The insignia is what we get pinned with after graduating nine months of intense trading on operating on a 300,000-pound, 20,000-horsepower piece of machinery. Decorated down a shaft is a Boatwain's mate's fancy line work. I've tried to do it for years and still no joy. It truly is an art. Further down, the wide part is a Master Chief Anchor, which is my current rank. Only 1% of people who enlist in the Navy are selected to Master Chief. Below the Anchor is our units patch with all of our craft numbers, the American Japanese flag and the Japanese symbol for 7. We are Naval Beach Unit 7. We refer to ourselves as Pirates and Cowboys. Additionally, there are three Chiefs Mess Coins. Military Challenge Coin Traditions are another of the many things we do. They are given to recognize remarkable achievements and are used to reward our sailors. That being said, we would love for you to give one to your mother for the remarkable recovery she has made. Lastly, you inspired me to start a newsletter of my own someday. Though they could be better, I've already created some letters using Y charts and people are loving them. They are learning. I just recently heard about the clinic that you are holding and would love to sign up when it becomes available. So he's saying him is invest- him is you know, learning about. It. So I'm dedicated, resourceful hard worker, and would love to learn under your guidance. Only thing is, there's a time difference due to the fact that I currently live in Japan. But hey, if there's a will, there's a way. 
Once I retire from the Navy, this is a life I want to live. Heck, I even have my five-year-old looking at charts, which she loves, by the way. Well, Frank, thank you and your team for all you do. And that's Anthony, Master Chief. I got this a couple of months ago, and we now do videos, right? Every, every podcast is audio, video, and, and for the video portion of this, I'm going to show this amazing, amazing paddle here. Uh, and here it is where it says, Frank Curzio, thank you for keeping it real. I mean, the stitching on this, it, it's unbelievable. And as you can see, you know, look, it, it, it's, you know, even when you turn it over on the back, um, it says, from the Cowboys and Pirates at Naval Beach Unit 7. And then it has probably around 15 of his sailors saying, just, you know, has little notes that they wrote. You share everything. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Frank, for everything. Thanks for all the lessons and stuff like that. So you could see how much time and effort goes into this and everything I read you, which is pretty amazing. Again, uh, you can go to Curzio Research YouTube page. That's absolutely for free, guys. I just think it's really cool. I like stuff like that when it comes to podcasts, when, uh, uh, you know, I'm, even ESPN's podcast or, or, you know, CNBC's, it's, you know, it's cool to watch the video version of it than, than just listen. So, but you have, a, a, you know, access to both. But if you came me through that letter, the first time I read, I was really choked up. And then, you know, I got a little choked up again where I think I messed up a couple sentences. But, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to read this today specifically. Uh, if you look at our country right now, especially in terms of politics. I mean, there's a clear division, right? Uh, and this division is in terms of our beliefs of how America can prosper and continue to be the leader of the free world. And a lot of those emotions run high sometimes, right? It gets pretty crazy. But if there's one thing that we could come together on, it's support for our military, which so many of us take for granted. And these are the people who fight for our right to post whatever we want on Twitter and Facebook, whether we're angry or not, to protect our Constitution, to make sure we're all safe while we basically, you know, argue with each other on the new iPhones, in our new cars, while we drink clean water and basically have access to an unlimited supply of food. We take that for granted. We all do. We all do. And for me, traveling, if I could tell you, if you're a millennial traveler to other countries, you've got to really appreciate the country you live in. You really will which is amazing. And a lot of this is given to us because of our veterans. And it is Veterans Day. And these people have fought for us. These people should never be forgotten. This is something that, that uh, um, you know, just truly honored, you know, to just to be living in this country, to be able to do this podcast on Wall Street Unplugged. Can this platform exist because of these people? Our freedoms exist because of these people? You can't understate that, guys. So I don't care what side you're on. We're going to have emotions when it comes to lots of different things, especially politics. But at the end of the day, listen, for Veterans Day, supporting all those veterans uh, who fought for us, who their mission and goal is to protect us, to protect our Constitution, to give us these freedoms— and it's very important that we address that today and not just the veterans, but the people currently in the military like Anthony, who, you know, his Pirates and Cowboys, Naval Beach Unit 7, thank you so much for protecting us. Thanks for all you do. You guys are truly the heroes. And I really, really appreciate that. I can't tell you that how much that paddle meant to me and showing my family and giving my mom uh, that badge, it, it, it was, you know, it was just unbelievable. And I really appreciate that. And when I do, when I do open this up for this clinic, Anthony, you're going to be first there. I'm going to open up to 10 to 15 people. I said I wanted to launch a token first. I'm going to create a clinic and teach 15 people pretty much everything I know. The only thing I want you to do is pass it on. When you guys get to that level, pass it on. That's the job. That's all of our jobs. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. Our job is to make the next generation better than ours. And you do that by sharing, not holding things back. Okay. And everything that I've learned, the teachers I've learned from, and I've been incredibly fortunate and incredibly lucky, right? My dad was just into this industry, learning from him at the dinner table, talking stocks when I was 10 years old, all the way to the point where I have Curzio Research and we launched the first ever, you know, equity token, which I'll get to in a minute. But 
on Veterans Day, I just want to say, guys, thank you so much for everything that you did. And when it comes to that class, when I open it up, I'm going to do it soon, probably in January, I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to select people. I do not want your resume. The letter that you just heard me read, that's what I want to see. I want to see the passion. I don't care what you did in the past, okay? Because you can write anything on a piece of paper and look good. But you can't motivate people. And this is only for, I will probably be kicking people out of this class if I think they're not giving it 100%. But it's going to be open to 10, 15 people. Those are young people who want to learn about the markets. And man, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. But Anthony, I promise that you are number one and be enlisted in that class when I start, hopefully... I'll have enough time, I should have enough time, to do it in January. So as you know, our Curzu Equity Owners Token is now free trading on the Merge Exchange. Still getting lots of questions, which is great, addressing all those questions, send a frank, Uh So Curzu Equity Owners, CEO, this is a security token where you will actually own an equity stake in Curzu Research, just like owning a stock, right? And we tend on paying a dividend. We already paid a quarterly dividend. We tend on paying it again. I have to say intend. So, you know, trying to make this a growth and income play. That's our job. But the CEO token is the first ever security token to trade in a global exchange that's available to retail investors. And I know you probably heard me say that a lot through this podcast, all read about this since our story was picked up. Major media outlets, Yahoo Finance, Forbes, Benzinga, Market Watch, you know, tons of them, uh, dozens more. But the reason I created this token and put my name on it along with my reputation. I mean, you could see right behind me, right? You got Cursor Research, right? Name's on the door. But the reason why I did is because I truly believe in this revolutionary idea. It's going to make it easier for every company to raise money to grow their business without having to pay those millions of dollars to investment banks. You don't have to be part of a club anymore. It's different. We all have pretty cool businesses, right? You own your business, you want to grow, you have a growth plan, and maybe investors might be interested in it. And it sucks if you're doing less than $10 million in sales because uh, you're probably not going to be able to go public or do anything like that. Or you know, doing a private round is, isn't so easy, right? And that's another thing with here when it comes to security tokens. Because it's giving investors the opportunity to invest in companies on the ground floor, right? Not when they IPO what we're seeing today with multi-billion dollar valuations like Palantir or Snowflake, when most of the growth's already taken place. And the best part what I was just talking about is you're not locked up for seven to 10 years, which the average lockup period for private investments, you know, that's the time frame. A good example is Airbnb. I mean, founded in 2008, probably started raising money 2010, 11, 12, you know, started really getting big as a concept went, you know, viral. It's not a publicly traded company yet. And the only way you can really cash out is maybe if you know somebody in one of those rounds when they raise money because you could sell it to them. But most people won't be able to cash out unless Airbnb gets taken over or they IPO, which they haven't done yet. But your money is locked up. With security tokens, it's 12 months if you do the offering, if you're a credit investor. And then after that 12 months, now you have the chance to buy a company like ours, Curzio Research. And it's a risky company. We're a small cap. Maybe people were doing videos and they say, Frank, you're an ugly guy and that's it. We don't want to deal with you anymore. Whatever it is. You know, maybe people hate financial newsletters. They don't like my opinion anymore. Whatever. It is a risky company. But, the, but what happens if magically I'm able to turn this into a billion dollar operation? You're in on the ground floor. That's the benefit of this industry. It checks off every single box. It's just a massive benefit to everyone, whether it's issuers, whether it's investors. Really, really exciting. That's why I chose to do our CEO token. So this is an industry I truly believe, truly believe there's going to be a trillion dollars in 10 years. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure we're smack in the middle of that amazing growth trend. And why? Because when you look at this industry, it reminds me of the early tech days in the 1990s or the early 1990s, right? Internet technology really started taking off. Yes, we all know about the 2000 crash. Yes, in March. You know, the 10 years leading up to that, though, it was unbelievable. And now look, you know, how much further we've come in terms of innovation when it comes to the internet and speeds and 5G, data analytics, AI. I can keep going here. 
But I don't need to tell you what Amazon, Microsoft, Qualcomm, Apple traded back then in the early 90s. This is an opportunity to do the same. That's why I'm so excited. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. Maybe it doesn't take off. But everything right now is going just as planned. The industry is growing. You're seeing more issues coming out. We're getting contacted by so many different people now that we launched this thing and it's public and it's pretty much everywhere. Again, we want to be a major force in this industry over the next 10 years. Now, you've heard about this from me numerous times, right? Numerous times. And I get it, right? I'm excited about it. You're excited about it. However, now I'm going to bring on a very special guest. First time I'm interviewing him, and his name is Sam Nosalehi. He's a CEO of T0. If you're not familiar with T0, you should be. Okay, It is part of Overstock. Overstock is that division that they wanted to sell a while ago. And then COVID happened, and everybody went to online, and they took full advantage of that right, with Overstock. But T0 is a business they own inside that, which is the largest secondary trading platform for digital securities in the world. So Sam may be one of the most important and well-respected people in the entire industry when it comes to security tokens. And once you hear from him, guys, you can understand why you need to start educating yourself about this industry. Again, the potential here is enormous. The risk is very little. But if this industry does take off, you're going to have access to a lot of these things through Curzio Research, through all of us. But again, you've heard it from me before. I want you to speak to one of the smartest people in the entire industry. Just a heads up here. The audio for this interview is going to be a little different. We had to improvise uh, this and he was put together very, very, very short notice, which is awesome. I mean, someone's doing this in Utah and agreed to come on the program. So we had to do it through Zoom, where usually we do it through live stream and it'd be the same exact sound quality. Just to let you know, the sound's going to be a little different. You're going to hear everything. Please pay close attention. You're going to see why this industry is ready to explode. Uh, talking to the best, the smartest person, uh, the most influential person in the entire security token industry. And let's get to that interview right now. Son, thanks so much for coming on Wall Street Unplugged. Thanks for having me, Frank. No, I really appreciate it, man. So, uh, I mean, let's start with the basics here for people who aren't familiar. You, you worked for Overstock for 14 years, uh, holding numerous leadership positions within technology, product development, marketing, uh, before becoming CEO of, of T0. When did you know this industry, digital securities, had the potential to be massive to the point where you were like, damn, we really need to get into this market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely before I joined T0. Um, uh, so we at, at Overstock uh, is a publicly traded e-commerce company, uh, primarily focused in the home space. And uh, at some point we decided to integrate Bitcoin as a payment method. Mm -hmm. And the minute we did that, there was a huge explosion in the, uh, just as far as media and publicity around around that event and we were actually very surprised how much coverage it got um, once that happened we uh we started to really study and see what are the various things this technology does and what's really behind it and started to see what blockchain could do for many industries uh and our founder at the time patrick Byrne, started medici ventures a, a venture group that invests in uh, blockchain companies. And we started to form and incubate T0 at that point. Uh, and that was uh, several years before I joined. Um, I was always fascinated by it and had the opportunity to finally make the switch. So we're talking, you know, 2015, 20, and some of that was even 2014, 2015 is when it was founded. Some of that is even before the term security token or token even <laughs> existed. You know, I, I don't like the term security token. I, I don't right. like this term digital securities only because it, it's not easy to explain. I think you're with me where, you know, we really want this to, to be scaled and it has to be easier and people have to understand it. But why don't we start with tokenization, which I think is something people can identify. Why don't you explain what, what that is really quick in a simple form? Because, you know, sometimes people get lost in all the definitions and the technical jargon, but tokenization is something I think everyone can identify with. Yeah, no, it's the process of creating a, a digital representation of an asset or a, a slice of a, a company or an asset that could be easily traded, transferred, settled uh, using this technology. And so that's that's really how we look at it. 
Yeah, and it's amazing because there's so many illiquid assets, right? When it comes to real estate, where it comes to the debt markets, and even when it comes to private companies, you know, like us, which you know we were able to take advantage of this doing our own CEO token. But uh, hopefully, there's a lot of other small companies that could follow suit because the process is very expensive, the traditional route. Uh, and, and let's go there so, so on the regulation front. And I'm, I know that you know it's not easy for you to talk about a publicly traded company, but compared to 18, 24 months ago, it, it was really difficult to. to venture into this industry, what has changed on the regulatory front? Because it's definitely easier. I see a new since September, everything, whether it's, you know, licenses taking partnering with, with, with you know, so many different firms, uh, just since September, I mean, your news flow is absolutely amazing. And, and it just seems like something opened up. Am I, is it right to say that? Yeah, no, de I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, it's taken a lot of effort, a lot of education, um, I think our firms and several firms have been spending quite a bit of time with, with the SEC and FINRA. And, uh, you know, they're starting to get it. I think they see how it can make their lives easier. It can automate a lot of things away that are very manual for them. And so um, it took some time and probably more time than I anticipated when I took the job. But um, they're really starting to see it. And, uh, and so there's recent no action letters around, you know, custody and settlement, you know, and, and so I think uh, you're going to see faster traction in the space. Uh, the last, you know, I would say year and a half, two years, we're mostly on build and regulatory clarity around what we're building. And um, I think uh, the build for, for us and many firms is now, you know, a lot of that's done and behind us, or at least the initial phase of it. Um, and on the regulatory front, we, you know, we have a fully approved trading ecosystem and uh, we see that just continuing to uh, progress and, and where we can realize more of the benefits of this technology. Um, right now we're, it's been very incremental. So I think we're getting some of the benefits, but there's still a lot more that could be captured uh, once regulators are comfortable and they're really starting to show that uh, their understanding of it. Yes. I, I mean, this, it seems like over two years ago, it was still maybe proof of concept type of thing. It's here, right? I mean, we're seeing it. Can you talk about that? And if you can, I understand what, about the amount of people coming to your platform. Again, I think you just recently announced uh, something about $300 million and working with a company to tokenize uh, yeah. you know, the asset or assets. But uh, are you see, starting to see that demand? Because it, it's almost like Uber, when I, it checks off every single box to the point, if you go, take an Uber, you're not gonna take CACs anymore. It's cheaper, it's safer, you can call the guy. This checks off every single box. Uh, I guess, you know, yeah. So if you wanna answer that question. Yeah, I think now we're in the market fit and traction phase of these digital securities. Um, I, I think uh, we're starting to see where's the first use cases where it provides the most value. I think private assets is a great example, and, uh, and there'll be others that come. Uh, tackling public markets, probably not the best idea to start with. Um, and yeah, I, we're seeing, you know, higher quality deals and larger deals with mm -hmm. some of the more recent issuers we're in conversations with, like the one you mentioned, which is Tintin Capital. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're a venture fund uh, that's looking to tokenize. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, we're starting to see a lot more good deals, primarily in real estate and funds. And then I guess behind that is more growth growth companies and technology companies. No, that's great news. That's great news. I think one of your biggest priorities and our biggest priorities that we're in this industry is trying to get new people to this platform and making it just easier. And we touched it a little bit before, but I thought you did a great job of this with the, uh, you know, paying over stock shareholders a dividend in the form of digital security, you brought a lot of people up to the platform, but how do we get institutions into this industry? And we're seeing that, you know, you've had announcements, but I'm talking about on, on a wider scale. Maybe the Goldman Sachs is maybe the Morgan Stanley's, JP Morgan's, uh, the Robinhood crowd, when do they start adopting this? Because this isn't that far off from utility tokens in terms of trading where, you know, this is secure. It's totally different. You don't get an equity stake with utility tokens. It's a different industry, but it's it's a pretty big industry, right? When it comes to trading, I would love to get that over security tokens, which provide much more transparency and compliance. And even mom and pop investors, what are some of the things that you're doing? Because I'm for me, we're really dialing it down and making it easy for people, but it's still not an easy flowing process. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, 
It's been challenging. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of that chicken and egg problem where if you have the right assets, the investors will come. If you have liquidity and an investor base, the assets will come. Um, we've found that as we show traction on either side, so we now have six broker dealers uh, trading uh, the securities on our platform, uh, including our own retail broker dealer, which just got approved and went live a couple weeks ago. Uh, so we are seeing traction. We do have, uh, for example, a large publicly traded uh, broker dealer subscribed and trading on for on the behalf of their clients, which is uh, institutions. So we're seeing some of that. I think we really need to see more quality assets trading, and they will come once they see the opportunity, and you know the value creation as as you may have seen. Mm-hmm. A lot of that has shifted more and more from, away from public markets to private. And so uh, the more investors that can participate in that, the more upside potential there is. And companies in general are is, you know, staying private much longer, up to 11 or 13 years in tech versus you know, three to four years in the past. And, uh, and so, uh, so I think we just need to continue to grow the ecosystem, both on the investor side and the asset front. And eventually the, the institutions will come. Now, you're talking about high quality deals. Uh, I know you guys do an extensive due diligence, right, on everyone that comes to your platform that wants yeah. to do this. Uh, how does that process work? Because I've seen people call me and say, hey, you know, we love what you did, Frank. You're trading on an exchange, uh, you know, with digital security. It's awesome. And I'll get into the details of what they want to do. And they'll say, you know, we're looking to raise $100 million. Okay. Well, what's the value for the token holders? Well, you know, when we make a profit, which is, five, 10 years from now, uh, then we're going to pay it. And for me, it, it's a turn off immediately because I'm someone that believes in this industry. We structured our token the right way. So it's we're, everybody's going to benefit, right? It's an equity stake. And we intend that to say we've already paid a dividend. We intend to pay a dividend. But are you seeing that with that process where people still have those utility token structure in, the, in their place and they, they still have it in their minds and they're saying, okay, let's structure it this way where there's really not too many benefits. Uh, how does that due diligence process work? And are you seeing some of those or are you seeing like really high quality deals right now? We're starting to see pretty good deals. And, uh, and we're also looking not just at these one-off deals, but the right kind of partnerships that could just bring uh, potentially hundreds of deals to the platform. And so uh, actually, yeah, anyway, I had a call with a firm yesterday that where we're looking for a partnership that could you know, that has, you know, hundreds of private assets already that could mm-hmm. easily be ported if we can come to terms with them. And so that's what we're looking for. I do think kind of uh, following utility tokens, um, you know, got, they were, I feel like getting maybe a little too creative with the assets mm-hmm. um, where I think, you know, we just, let's just get the fundamentals right and working. And then we could do, you know, kind of these very unique type securities, but so. Well, no, no, that that definitely makes sense. And and switching tunes here, because, you know, I started doing a lot of research and I was fascinated. Uh, You're a person that that pays very close attention. It's very important when it comes to to culture. Uh, I've been at places throughout my career. I've been doing this for over 25 years where culture has been bad and it hasn't been pretty. And when culture is good, like for our company right now, and they see a lot of growth avenues, it's you know, the motivational factor, people are gonna work harder. Uh, how important is that? And how difficult is it to keep that culture? Because we are in an industry that I think we both believe, and we'll go over, we'll talk about forecasts later, what we both think where this industry can go. But you know, when you look at it in an industry that can grow so much uh, and have so many ups and downs, right? So it's so early in the growth phase. Is it difficult to keep that culture like always positive? Because I know, again, that's something you work hard, play hard environment. I was just curious to hear that. Yeah, culture has been tough, especially, I mean, COVID has even made it even more challenging where you don't get as much in person and get Mm -hmm. to do company events and things like that to, uh, to really... Uh, pass that culture on to the team. Um, so it's, it's definitely made it challenging. It's, you know, T0 has been an unusual culture to form for me, different than what I'm used to, because you have this traditional financial, heavy, heavily regulated world mixing kind of with Silicon Valley, you know, disruption, 
just get your code out and get feedback and, and iterate. Uh, but generally, like we like problem solvers, people who are entrepreneurial, will, are willing to take risks, but it has to be the right kind of risk. And, and also really understanding the line of uh, where what's ethical, what's not. And, uh -huh. and, you know, you got, I think in the financial world, you know, especially there always comes opportunities to do things that could potentially be short term gains. Yes. Exactly. But this is in, we're all in this for the long term. And so it's, it's, you gotta, you gotta be careful on that line you walk. But generally, we like people out of the box thinkers who are, uh, you know, problem solvers. And, uh, but it, it has been more challenging, particularly more recently. Yeah. Now I can imagine with, with, with COVID and everyone now coming to the office. I mean, that is a pretty big deal. I mean, I just went, traveled for the first time. I went to Wyoming to seats for a site visit. And I have to tell you, it, it, it was, you really need to meet face to face. People say you could do everything at home. At that meeting that I met with very high profile, it, that was important for me to meet them face to face than just going on a conference call. There is a difference. I, people say, well, we get stuff done and we invest in companies. I mean, hopefully that changes and we open back up now with the vaccine news. But uh, I think it's been challenging for, for a lot of companies in terms of, of that culture. But you talk long term, right? Uh, where do you see this industry? Because I, I'm very excited about it, but I always temper my expectations, even for this when I say, hey, you're, you can invest in our token, but we're a small cap company. Maybe people don't like me anymore. Maybe we don't sell newsletters. It is risky. I always highlight the risk reward, but I'm super optimistic on this industry. I wanted to hear your thoughts of where we're going to be maybe three to five to 10 years from now, because we're really moving incredibly fast over the last, I feel like six months, especially with some of the announcements that you made that we see so securitized overall globally. I mean, this is here now. This isn't like a concept where we're thinking, oh, this could be big. I mean, this is here. What are your expectations over the next, you know, three, five, 10 years? Yeah, no, I think we're transitioning out of build to growth and adoption. And you'll see that continue to get stronger in the next two years. Uh, I think you're starting to see that market fit and traction happening. Um, what I think longer term, I think you'll see several pockets where you'll see this mar market fit uh, in different uh, niches. So um, private assets is one, but I think there's potential to, uh, you know, trade many things of value uh, over an exchange. And so I think, you know, our, our kind of long term vision is trade anything of value in a very quick, like near instant settlement way. Uh, and whether that, I mean, that could include all sorts of things and to being able to democratize that to, to anyone, whether it's, you know, it might be an athlete sports contract to, you know, early stage startups, growth companies to kind of mid stage. Uh, and I think just enabling access to all these various assets that we don't traditionally think of as assets or don't, don't have access to. You know, you said something pretty amazing. I think people might skip through just uh, uh, when it comes to assets where, where you're saying we could, we'll be able to trade any asset of value. Uh, you know, for the audience listening to this, watching this, you have to understand that's millions, tens of millions of assets that can be tokenized. Do you actually see this maybe, because I think we both agree with this, at least some of the things that, that I read the, and some of the statements you made with the IPO process. Could this really replace that as you know when ipos come out like snowflake multi-trillion multi-billion dollar valuations a lot of that growth has already taken place you know it's it's on it's not a level playing field right from mom pop investors early stage investors do you think this has a shot because we're seeing it with SPACs, really right just a different form of ipos almost uh and so showing that security tokens i think could be right there as well but uh i mean is that is that a possibility to you uh, potentially, yeah. I think it's it's really being able to participate in these in in anything of value from inception of the idea all the way to whether it's a public company. Whether this stuff completely eliminates the public markets or not, I mean, I think that's to be determined. I'm I'm not as sure on that. That mm -hmm. public markets may still have a role, uh, but you know, today it's not like uh, you know, when, when even Netflix or Amazon's went public, you know, so much of their growth happened while they were public. Mm -hmm. And now companies are kind of waiting till the last moment, you know, like an Uber IPO, it's all, they already have a global presence. So they're, 
I'm not sure if there's as, there definitely isn't as much upside there. Um, plus, you get these IPOs that are completely misvalued. When you have uh, price discovery in a market from early on through whether they IPO or not, you don't have weird situations like that where you know they're trying to uh, private private equity firms are controlling the valuations behind the scenes. It's it's what the market says the value is, and so I think. Uh, it should really smooth out a lot of this weird stuff that happens where, you know, the inside bankers get a participate early, realize a lot of gains, and then it IPOs and it plummets. Uh, so, um, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, whether public markets still exist or not, I sort of see it as, you know, have liquidity for uh, everything from start, from the start of an idea all the way to, you know, to the end of its life. Yeah, I mean, if this concept really takes off the way I believe, right? I'm not gonna put words in anybody's mouth. It's just, you know, what you said about assets, I think you have to realize in the debt market, we're talking trillions, right? We're talking a market that that's, you know, whatever, it's five, six, seven X bigger than the stock market. And you're talking about real estate, which is tens of trillions, right? So, you know, illiquid assets that could easily be tokenized. Uh, and you're seeing that now, even with some of the real estate deals that, that you guys are announcing, and you're seeing that out there, uh, that is really in in incredible when, when you throw around that number. So uh, I don't know uh, if that's going to happen in, in five years, 10 years, but it, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty happy. And I guess we'll end on that. I mean, are you excited about the path this has taken in terms of the speed? Because I thought it would happen a little bit earlier in the last six months. I'm very excited now where when COVID came, I said, oh, don't tell me this is going to take a step back now. But I'm pretty comfortable here. I mean, are you are you excited? Obviously, you're, gonna, you're excited with your company in the future, but it seems like this growth is really starting to, to pick off. To, to really yeah, no, action. we're we're very excited. Uh, you know, uh, I told I like I said I really underestimated the regulatory lift and challenges, uh, but these are securities, and you know the regulators play an important role. And I I sort of just thought let's just build it and get going. And uh, uh, but we're seeing very positive signs from regulators, and, mm -hmm. uh, and like we mentioned. Um, so, and, and just in the last few months, I mean, I think COVID slowed, uh, business development down a little bit in the mm -hmm. kind of April, May timeframe, but mm -hmm. we've really seen things start to pick up now. Um, I don't know if people are just accustomed to it or not as worried, uh, but, uh, yeah, we're seeing really quality deals. So we're quite excited. No, that's great stuff. So, so now if someone wants to learn more about T0, learn more about you, how could they do that? Uh, t0.com and uh, there's ways to contact us sales at, at t0.com you can email me directly even uh, Sam at t0 cool and, and the most important question here by far than anything we talked about yep. you're doing this from Utah I know you attended Utah I think I'm pretty sure they're playing their first game of the year right as <laughs> UCLA so I know from people I know from Utah that you know football is you know life basically so uh, I'm curious if you're excited that that's uh, coming up so <laughs> yeah it's starting up I'm actually based in oh well right now I'm in Utah I was in New York but mm -hmm. for the time being I'm out here uh, it's actually snowing right now which is uh. crazy man that's great that's nice so uh yeah i've been to utah a lot great place so uh listen thank you so much for coming on i know how busy you are uh this means a lot to to, to my digital token holders and to, to my list and people who follow us so uh thank you so much for taking the time and uh, i know we'll speak again soon pleasure being here and great meeting you frank thanks for having me okay guys great stuff from Sam there it, just uh, amazing potential as you could see for security tokens just truly honored that he was willing and able to come on this podcast to talk about it. But this is something, obviously, I'm excited about. I know you guys are excited about based on the emails. If you have any questions, comments, one, you can go to the T0 website, uh, which is pretty easy to find, T0.com, and, and learn about it before even signing up for an account if you want. Or just, again, get educated about it. You're going to see more and more of these alternative trading platforms being launched uh, because a lot of them are getting the proper regulations or just buying companies with those licenses in place. You'll see from the compliance point of view, everything's starting to ease up. And it's just a matter of time for this industry really goes mainstream. And it could take a couple of years. But for now, just as you can see, a, a ton of potential. And I want to thank them, uh, the T0 team, for putting this together. I really appreciate it. And questions, comments, as always, feel free to email frankersresearch.com. Now, a lot going on I discussed right at the opening in terms of 
The vaccine from Pfizer being 90% effective, resulting in a major shift in allocations here. I'm going to cover in a second. We have the election results, which we haven't talked to my buddy Daniel about, which he said, I believe, that Donald Trump was going to win in a landslide, right? So let's bring in Daniel. And Daniel, I want to hear from you about what happened during the election. Well, hello, Frank. I have some friends of mine that are pissed off at me. And everybody keeps saying I'm wrong. And I'll admit when I'm wrong if it turns out to be. But what I said was he's going to win in a landslide unless what? They steal it from him through the mail-in ballots and stuff. And I said that on the twenty October 28th podcast. Uh, and even before that, one of the biggest dis- – actually, first of all, Happy Veterans Day to all the veterans out there. Um, that's very important. I didn't serve personally, but I am so grateful that we have such amazing men and women that do. And I am very grateful for that. And happy Masters Week. Masters. Masters. I know. Isn't that weird? You're not it is. And it's probably going to rain flowers. on them every day. Not it, to mention it's not going to – well, it'll still be beautiful because well, the They have a hurricane nice. coming up right through Florida. It's not really a big deal. It's like flooding more than anything, but I think it's going to go through yeah. Georgia a little bit. So that, That'll be interesting. But yeah, thank goodness be. that we have a major. And then if it's on schedule, how sweet would it be if they turn around and play it in April? Yeah. Maybe. They get back on schedule. It's going to be like 30 mile an hour wind coming at you. So, so Shambo would only be able to hit the ball like 330 yards instead of like 390. <laughs> but uh, So anyway, hey, that yeah. was a rabbit trail. So back to this. So on, uh, we talked about how the media and everybody was setting up this narrative of, hey, Trump's going to look like, I think it was Axios that we quoted, uh, hey, Trump's going to look like he's winning on election night. And then once all the mail-in ballots come in, he's going to lose. And then we'll have President-elect Biden. Um, so the disgustingness was everybody was getting into that conditioning of, ah, well, we're not going to know who's our president. Um, you know, the greatest superpower in the history of the world as a country can't elect a freaking president in one evening. That shows you the uh, logistics and efficiency of governments in general. Now, what I warned about was the craziness going on. And what is exactly that happening is that you still don't have official counts going, although the media is quick to run with the narrative that president elect Biden Uh, He's already starting to name some people and all that, which I understand. However, there are some serious lawsuits that have been filed by the Trump campaign, which, you know, we told you every each side was lowering, lowering up. They had hundreds, if not thousands of lawyers and volatiles on both political parties. But I want to take the crazy thing here is, Frank, is that the media is so quick. How right was the media again? And I know you talked about this. I think it was last podcast Mm -hmm. about the polls and stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you fire me here from Curzio Research, I'm going to, I was going to go be a weatherman because that's, that was the best no accountability job in the world. I bet you there's Democrats listen to this that say, Frank, you should fire him right oh, now. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> send your emails to Frank. Don't send them to me. Send them in. Uh, Love us, hate us. Just you can don't, figure it out. Just don't right? ignore us. We all have a Curzio Research address and Daniel's first name. Daniel, <laughs> you can figure it out if you try, guys. I'm sure you're going to hit it. So I'm just letting you know. Go ahead, buddy. Unlike Frank, I don't read all the feet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, weatherman, how easy was that? You know, oh, well, we were wrong. Well, you know, Mother Nature changed. You know, we call in for this, that, and the other. It's the easiest job, not the easiest job in the world. It's on the accountability side. I'm having fun out there weather people to calm down. Now it's polling because in 2016, they were completely dead wrong, given Hillary a landslide. And leading up uh, in late October, I think uh, Real Clear Politics and everybody had Biden a double digit favorite. And the day before, they had him at a 7% favorite, I believe. And we heard nothing but this blue wave and everything was going to go the Democratic way because everybody hates Trump. And the narrative was beat up and beat up and beat up, built up. And what happened? How, how big was that blue wave, Frank? I mean, you're looking at when it comes to the seats in the Senate. I mean, they're really disappointed. I mean, the Democrats oh, are yeah, extremely are. disappointed, even though they won the election. They lost seats they in the are House. Dis- they, there's a lot going on. And there's still their how seat. many undecided? Yeah. There's still a lot undecided. Mm-hmm. Now, the Senate's a whole different um, animal because Alaska who must have grizzly bears helping count ballots because Alaska How's just Alaska? counted. <laughs> What's the population of, I mean, I don't want to throw shade on it. <laughs> I, I, I went to Anchorage, sake, Alaska once, and, and there might, you know, it seems like there's like 60 people there. Like, <laughs> how, could that, how could that take so long to count? We have any subscribers or listeners in Alaska? I wonder if they'll email in. I love Alaska, by the way. I loved it. I'd oh, love it's to gorgeous. Go I was on a saying, cruise up there. Oh. seems like it'd be pretty easy to count the votes. Go ahead. Exactly. So they finally called it today. I saw uh, a cross briefing this morning that they called the Alaska uh, Senate race for the Republicans. Uh, Sullivan is jumping out at me, but don't hold me to that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the big um, runoff in Georgia could decide the power of the Senate. Now, that's huge because the volatility leading up to the presidential election expecting a blue wave was a Mm sell-off. So 
early January or even back up before that, that's when the actual runoffs come in Georgia. So what is it going to look like from here through December and Christmas on the volatility on the market side? Because you know we're going to see a ton of headlines on how much money is going to be spent in Georgia. It's probably going to be one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive, mm -hmm. Senate race. That runoff, yeah. Um, and all the headlines leading up to that, if you're a big money manager or even a regular investor, how do you not brace yourself for if the Senate goes Democratic, then you have possibly— There's a lot of major changes. Uh, it's not saying that, that, that the market's going to crash here. It's saying that, you know— Oil companies are definitely going to crash, right? I mean, they're mostly against fracking. Well, that's what You're I'm saying. You would just think of, hey, what's going to happen if— Huge. Because right now the market is pricing Taxes. in a balance of powers. Mm -hmm. Hey, who cares who the president is because you have the other party holding at least one branch. In this case, it looks like the Senate. Well, if you get that narrative to change, how in the world wouldn't you expect volatility in the stock markets? Mm -hmm. That's crazy to me. Yeah. So— Getting back to how ridiculous the polls are. So the media is the only one running away with this on how the election is over. And they're totally ignoring a few big things. And I don't know, and I know everybody's biased and gonna gonna take shots at this, but this is what stands out to me, just like the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So did you see any highlights about Ken Starr being on yes, Mark Levin yep, or Levin? Yep. How do mm -hmm. you say that? Yep. And by the way, can anybody else think of Ken Starr without thinking about Monica Lewinsky or is that just me? Never. Okay. <laughs> just figured. <laughs> just checking. Hey, yep. um, so he goes on there and he uses some pretty powerful words talking about how it's a constitutional travesty of what happened in Pennsylvania with the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. So when I say Supreme Court, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and the legislative area, the, the, the smaller um, legislation, closer to the vest, as you would say. Mm -hmm. Basically what's going on, and this is all going to get tied up in courts, and then you even have a U.S. Supreme Court, uh, what's his name? I always screwed up. Al Kavanaugh? No, Alito. Alito. He come out and said, hey, well, they they're going to separate yeah. ballots in Pennsylvania that came in after 8 p.m., I think it was. Mm -hmm. Well, Ken Starr's whole point was, listen, the governor of Pennsylvania didn't get it passed at the correct legislation side, the smaller end of the rules he wanted because he wanted to accept ballots that came in after Election Day. So he went to the state Supreme Court. That's a split vote. That got passed. Evidently, what he's, Ken Starr is saying is, hey, that is totally wrong. And if the U.S. Supreme Court, with Amy just joining there, mm -hmm. Barrett, um, evidently you're going to have to cancel all those votes out. Now, how do you come to the number of however many that is? Is it 10,000? I mean, how do, you, how do you calculate that out? Is it like an assembly line? You say, well, at 8 o'clock, there's roughly X amount counts, you know, mm -hmm. votes counts per hour. I don't know. But my point is, is that that is not an easy thing. And Trump is not going to let that go. Like, we haven't heard the end of this. I know the odds look terrible uh, for Trump as the presidency. But going back to the last contention, how long did it take old Al Gore to concede? It was more like, I think it was like six weeks, wasn't it? Uh, 30, was it 36 days? It was over 30. Mm -hmm. So Trump, you know, he's sitting back there going, no, we got plenty of time. Yeah. We're only, a, you know, a week and, you know, such afterwards. <laughs> so, yeah, I know I look silly. Um, we're going to have to really watch the Senate race. But there is, well, you can ask another question, but there is a good thing about the House and Senate and getting down to the details of the votes. Investors and people, capitalists, should be excited regardless of who wins the presidency or who is named because there was a lot of positivity, especially in Florida and uh, minority communities voting for freedom and capitalism versus mm -hmm. socialism. Yeah. And that is a huge tailwind. Th and that was a excited. clear result of people voting for capitalism on both sides, which is great. But yeah. I have to tell you, I, I didn't believe it like the last three, four days. And, and you know, I feel like that, you know, it was over. But I got to tell you a, a couple of things here that, that I think one of the things that I was surprised at is that the Democrats are actually ha have forces on the ground counting the votes in North Carolina. And believing that they have a shot to win that state. I, I just, it for me, for that to be your goal right now tells me that you don't think that you, you actually won yet because you're ahead in I mean, Wisconsin, called for Biden. Uh, Georgia, you're ahead in. You're looking at Arizona, you're ahead in. Nevada looks like you won. I mean, this is a pretty easy win. And yesterday I heard about them going to North Carolina. It, it makes me think like, you know, again, we have to... I don't know if there's, there's fraud, right? It hasn't been proven yet, so no one can say there is, there isn't, right? You could think there is, or think there isn't. If you're a Republican, you think there is. If you're a Democrat, you think it isn't, all right? Let's put that aside. There's one thing that we need to do that, that's very important. Half of the country 
believes that there was something going on here. So counting these legal votes is important because it's going to put that to rest and say, okay, hey, it was fair. And I get it because I stayed up to 3.30 in the morning watching Trump's speech. I was, you know, again, watching CNX. They had great coverage that day. And just they had their tails in between their legs when they went to bed. I mean, basically when, when they signed off almost at three o'clock uh, and they were just like, just keep up the hope, keep up the hope. And just, you know, everything was in Trump's fair. And just to wake up where, why did all the states stop counting at, at, at 10 PM, 9 PM, 9 30, 10? Why? I don't understand. Why did you stop and then continue at 3 30 AM? That's a little weird to me. Uh, I'd like to have an answer to that, but you know, again, we all know those mail-in ballots and whether they're harvested or whatever, they've all come in. But, if Trump is claiming fraud, you have to have fraud. I mean, now you're talking about his legacy that could be damaged considerably if you know, you're know you not going to concede when there is no fraud. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure all the votes are counted. We want to make sure this is legal. And there's a lot of shit that happened in these states that just are statistical anomalies that, that just, you know, all every single vote, there's like 110,000 of them that came in, every one of them a Biden, and they only voted Biden. They didn't vote down a ticket. So for everyone that voted here, Democrat, Republican, you didn't just check off the president and, and hand in your thing. No, you go down the line, really, of what party you are. Almost everybody does, and it takes a little while. So if you didn't just check it off, it, you know, it, it's and a lot of, uh, of those votes that came in, I just think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. And if you're a Democrat and if you're Biden and you truly believe that, if you're going on TV say we need to unite the country, if you want to unite the country, go through this process, right, which is fair, and make sure you're counting all the legal votes. And I think both sides could agree to that because we want to get past this shit, right? I think, Daniel, I mean, it, 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 I mean, the emotions behind No, it, there you go again, being too nice, giving people the benefit of the doubt, Frank. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know. Yeah, it, of course, everybody would like to get by. But the Democrats, hey, they won. They're, they're moving on. They don't want anything to backtrack. So they're not going to say, they're going to say, hey, count all votes, which is kind of funny because words have meanings. So you have Trump fighting the whole count all legal votes, mm -hmm. and you have the Biden and Democrats saying count all votes. Yeah. Well, obviously you want to count all votes because yeah. that's what's going to push you I just don't understand the, the concept, whether it would be better for Republicans or Democrats, is how the hell could, could you vote after the election? I'm not talking about something that's postmarked before. There's states that you could vote like two days later in Pennsylvania, yeah. like, like which doesn't make, like if you have mail-in ballots, why not have them come in a week before? These people are home. This way they're counted going in but we should never have this where, where you know, all these, like, we're talking about 600,000 plus votes in Michigan came in after, uh, on Friday. And, and It's a lot. I don't know the exact number. But yeah, you're right. I so mean, you on. keep applying too much common sense. Like, why wouldn't you do it that way unless. I don't know. Exactly. It's ridiculous. I just don't know why. Yeah. Cause and granted, you got to take everything with a grain of salt. But again, the media is running away with this narrative, which is fine because they've been dead wrong for now mm -hmm. four total years. Uh, you know, you got to take everything with, with so much salt. It's not funny, but, uh, Giuliani's out there saying they have witnesses again, he's mm -hmm. going to be totally biased. And it's been a back and forth. It's been like, it is, but you, evidently there's FDA several came out today. It, it's, it's such, you know, it's enough. Like I think everyone is, but the bigger quick question oh. to me, actually the funniest thing to me and not ha ha funny, more pathetic funny is that the last four years, the narrative has been, Hey, this looks bad. Something's not right here. Investigate this. And they've investigated all kinds of shit. Yeah. Everything from big to little. And mostly they, has listen, turned out The Republicans out nothing. are right to call this. That, that's well, just, absolutely. I mean, but it, my point is, is that this, yeah. now you have people that you have a, a whistleblower from the UPS. I think mm -hmm. there's more than one now. Mm -hmm. But everybody writes it off because of Project Veritas, James O'Keefe. Well, he's too conservative, so he's got an agenda. This guy is literally on record. The Washington Post, uh, Washington Times, somebody came out and said that he went back on his story. He had to come out today and said, no, I still stand by it. Mm. You know, he heard or saw people. There's just so much crap going so on. Crap, but the yeah. narrative is to not look into it now. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, no, we, you know, the New York Times put out a story yesterday saying, hey, we contacted officials from every state, no evidence of fraud. Oh, well, hell, that settles it, yeah. you know. It's just yeah, it's the narrative changing you on when you go from investigate stuff. everything yeah. to, yeah. hey, you yes. know what, we still haven't called every state, but whatever, we're good, let's move on. That just shows you what kind of craziness is, and that's, uh, but... Thinking that Trump is going to go away quietly, you know, anybody that thinks that I think is just trying to, I don't know what they're thinking. That's just yeah, crazy. I He's just think, thinking. look, if you want unity, there is, even even if the Republicans would have won, there would have been half the country that thinks that, that okay, it wasn't fair or something's wrong. And just to get that, and the, you're going to make the process better by doing what you're doing right now. And that's really what we need. We all know this process is broken. It's terrible. Uh, you shouldn't have, you know, three, four, five different days. We're not just talking about one state, Florida, big deal. We're talking about numerous states. We all know this was coming. We all knew it was going to be a, a very, very tight. 
uh, in these battleground states, which is the reason why they were campaigning so much, you know, ahead of the election, the week leading into the election. But more important to this point, because, you know, again, when we get to politics, we get a lot of, uh, you know, we get different viewpoints and fun emails. And again, remember, that's Dana doing the talking. <laughs> Frank. But uh, the most important point that, that you mentioned, Daniel, is, is one is hopefully there's a smooth transition regardless, like we figure this out. And the bigger point is, you know, what's going to happen in the Senate race, right? It's not officially over. The Republicans are leading. Both those races are going to be a runoff in early January. Who knows what happens to now to January? I read interesting statistics where there's, I think, twenty five to 30,000 kids that are going to uh, – Go from seven to get their birthdays. They're gonna ch- they're gonna be eighteen years old. By oh, the gonna hit the to now. eligible voter. And yeah. we're talking about a few ten thousand votes, which is interesting, right? So it, it, it's not a done deal. And I think on both sides, it's always pretty bad for the markets if you have just, you know, if you had that blue wave, if you had the red wave. It's nice to have those checks and balances in place in terms of your investment. So that's what we were talking about. And let's move on from the election here. It's important we talk about it because it is relation, related to your portfolio and how you're going to allocate. And also, speaking of allocation, Daniel, talk about, I mean, the vaccine came out. I've done a ton of research on the vaccine. I actually, uh, two weeks ago, I posted on YouTube, I saw a great research report by one of the best analysts. He works for Evercore, uh, best biotech analyst saying, look, there's a good shot that this is going to have 90% plus to 95% plus efficacy, be effective. Uh Everyone, and I told everyone that the consensus was for 60%, right? The flu virus is 40%. The MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, is, is that's 90%. So this is on par with that, and nobody doesn't go out because they're afraid of getting that because of this vaccine, right? Measles, mumps, rebel anymore. So I mean, it's game-changing news, but are you surprised in a rotation that we're seeing? I mean, maybe stay-at-home stocks, I get it, but this is going to take a long time to develop, right? Yeah, I, I would. I mean- We've talked about this in the past and in, in, in both on and off camera a little bit, I think. But, uh, you know, the volatility is just crazy because you got so much liquidity, uh, a lot of algorithms. Uh, so you're seeing moves that typically you think, all right, this stock's going to move three to five percent, ends up moving 10 percent or more. So there's going to be a lot of knee jerk reaction. That's the new normal. Um, it did surprise me a little bit on how hard some stocks got hit. So when the market was rallying like crazy, housing stocks sold off. Um, Toll Brothers. And things like that, which did surprise me a little bit. They've bounced back since. But yeah, I, I don't understand the idea. I understand the market looks forward and you have to price stuff in. But they're talking about, I mean, not even the majority of people, but when do you think a big enough percentage of people would take that to where somebody is three people and no, away from knowing? And that's at least mid next year, right? So, I, look, I, you know, there's reports. I, I guess from- I don't know. I understand the, the market pricing it in. That doesn't shock me. What shocks me is to think now it's like, okay, from here forward, how soon do you think people are going to have the mindset difference of, all right, now it's safe to go out? And, and that's the thing where we talk about sentiment here, right? Which is yeah. improving. It's not necessarily like, okay, we're going out there and, the, and these are facts and we're like, holy cow, you know, it, it, this is about sentiment, right? Sentiment drives markets. But. When I look at this vaccine, I'd be very surprised if anyone outside the danger zone gets it before June. And I'm talking about people who are over 70. They have Obviously, they, they're going to roll it out to the most. To the people who are most right. would say should. So, yeah, that's But then they're think. saying, yeah, another report that I read from, from um, Lyrink, who's, who's one of the best in biotech uh, you know, research outfits, that they have the COVID numbers in terms of revenues that's going to be generated from, you know, say if Moderna comes out, Pfizer, whatever. See, Johnson, they all come out with their vaccines, right? They're all 90% plus, whatever. They said that they're not going to see a decline in sales within this part of the, the vaccine industry, uh, specifically to COVID, starting in 2025. Think about that. That's five years from now. So you're going to see massive amount of tests, even more tests now take place than ever, because I've seen testing companies get nailed here, which is surprising. We have COVID cases that that you know record levels right now. We'll more and more people are getting tested. Yep. That's not going to stop anytime soon. Uh, if you want more evidence where, hey, it doesn't mean that, you know, again, we were saying to buy all these stocks and buy these sectors and this is eventually going to happen. But when you see a 40% move in, in Carnival Cruises one day and then you see American Airlines with a 20% move and Daniel, what did these companies do that very day? We had a good discussion about this. I think it's brilliant and not that Frank has taken the other side on how markets work and stuff, but it was great. They started raising money and so did pot stocks. Uh, pot stocks raised money. They just did an offering and raised a ton of money as their price shot up. And to your point, it shows weakness, right? 
Well, go ahead. It kind of shows weakness no, because it, it, it's like, hey, you know, why not? You you want to try to get it as much or high yeah, as you can. Yeah, so basically- You take your first, you know, nice pop, I guess. These companies are not sharing the same outlook as everybody else. I think it is very smart for them to raise money. But if they really thought that this was going to take off and there's no shot of this going back down, they wouldn't be raising money in the same day that, you know, that vaccine announcement came out, which is what, Monday and then Tuesday, you know, Monday and Tuesday, these companies were raising money. Yeah. Uh, they would do it at a much higher price, which tells you that they're, you know, they're playing it safe. They're doing. I'm not saying that they're not doing the right thing. It's it's fine. What I'm saying is that these companies do not believe this is over. They're raising money. Right. They don't think their stocks are going through the roof and everything's going to be great. As they should. I mean, that's you got to look forward. You got to do what's best in the interest of your shareholders. And I, it does look, you know, it is a shine a weak sign of weakness in its short term. But uh, it's great to see how, you know, that's how capitalism works. You know, you're in a tough industry. You get a pop. You want to raise money. You got investors giving you money. It's all about uh, surviving and uh, thriving from here. So, yeah, I, I thought it was good to see all that. It kind of it kind of brings some normalcy back into uh, into our job. It, it definitely does. And again, it's a big change in terms of sentiment. Where there's hope now that you know maybe in a couple of years, COVID isn't going to really exist. Where people are going to be worried about it. But again, we got to go through the testing. We got to go through so many different things, which is. Uh, and, and hopefully there's no setbacks, right? I mean, we don't even have emergency approval on this thing yet. And we have Pfizer saying they're sending out like, what, 1.3 billion doses next year and something like 500 million, this, whatever those numbers Yeah, are. what if there's a headline that cuts that in half? What kind of volatility is going to happen there? Uh, yeah, it's just, and not only that, when I'm looking at the price, I think they're going to pay $15 per shot or whatever it is, you know, and there's two shots that you're going to need, right? It's, it's two two shots that you need. I don't know how the time frame in between those. <laughs> But again, that includes so you cut that in half. So those doses are basically half the amount of people that are going to get them. Yeah. Because you got to get the, the dose twice. Just like uh, you don't do that with the flu shot. Uh, most flu shots, I don't believe. I never heard about. It. But you know, with some of the other ones, measles, some measles, uh, the MMM vaccine. You, you know, sometimes you get a, at a later period. Uh, but when I look at the rotation here going on, I still think there's tremendous opportunity. You're seeing it in small caps. Uh, you know, a lot of these technology names are going to continue to generate a, a shitload of money uh, and cash flow and, and recurring revenue, and their balance sheets have never been stronger. But, you know, be careful of all the stocks you buy. There's still a lot of names that went up that are still down 20, 30%. But, you know, my biggest concern is are we going to get a stimulus with all this nonsense going on, which is probably going to go on to January? I don't see Trump conceding before then. Yes, we're trying to do it on the side. Mitch McConnell's trying to do it on the side, but I just, I just don't see it coming. Uh, and if we don't have a stimulus, you're seeing numbers. I'm hearing from my sources, very close sources, okay? I'm hearing that Amazon's numbers are, are, are declining. They're not doing that good. They're not giving overtime anymore. For me, I said this a couple of weeks ago, Daniel, that I saw even from emails that I've been getting and reports I'm reading, there's just a, a, a decline in spending all of a sudden. And it makes sense when you think about it, right? Because you had this massive stimulus where everyone was just getting money for free, checks, here, right? You need a business loan? Who cares what you do? Who cares if you need it? Here you go, right? So everyone's like, holy shit. And what do you do? You spend, you buy a whole bunch of stuff. Now we're going through the next wave of this. And most companies cannot operate at 80% capacity, which is what the US is open at right now. Most companies can't, right? And some companies are going to benefit tremendously and some companies aren't, like gyms and restaurants and stuff like that. We really need the stimulus. If we don't get it, I mean, this market, and I'm going to ask you this, Daniel, we talked about this all the time, right? Since March, April, May, this whole entire thing, when we were coming back up and everything, you know, it felt like we've been ahead of the news on this when it comes to COVID. We have low interest rates, super low interest rates, going to stay low for a while. If they go higher in the long end, we're going to get yield curve control. That's for fact. We can't have these interest rates going higher. We just have too much debt. Uh, the Fed will manage that. We all know that. You're looking at a stimulus plan coming most likely. Say if we get in the next two, three months, I get it. The vaccine announcement is now out. All great news that people are now incredibly bullish, incredibly bullish on the market, even though we're near all-time highs, right? This is stuff that we knew about, and stocks are trading pretty much at the highest level since the tech boom. I mean, it's 21 times forward earnings. Do you think this is factored in? I mean, how much higher could we go here on news that's kind of been expected? At least we've been talking about it here for months. Uh, that worries me a little bit. It seems like a lot is priced in. You know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think we're I think we're pretty much I don't want to say perfectly priced or priced to perfection. Um, yeah, because I you know even though we have such knee jerk reactions and everybody does know about that stuff, I think that optimism is going to prevail, and I think in general things are going to trend higher until we get a negative negative headline, uh, something on a setback about the vaccine or whatever. But I do think in in Frank has been very good about calling this. Um, what I think is interesting is that. I don't think we're pricing in anything on the election. 
and I, I know I keep bringing it back to politics, but if in addition to what you've said, what we're not talking about is what if some evidence does come up that's decent on the pr tre President Trump side? Or what if something comes up to make it look like Democrats are going to control all three branches of the government? Uh, that mixed in with anything that you've said that's a setback. So I, I don't know why pr people are running out to buy some of the stuff that they are just because on a recovery. Because again, we're six months away from people living the lives of normal. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll be uh, honest, I was shocked. I thought there would be a, another stimulus by now. So I did get that one wrong. I thought that they would pass something because it was an election year. I think Trump did a few things on the executive order or whatever side, but you also have the Fed, you know, basically still helping on the lending side. Uh, but yeah, it, I don't think it's, if, if, if they keep dragging their feet on the stimulus, something has got to give because you're spending on, it, your spending is going to have to crash because everybody that got bumped from the stimulus is still in waiting. And you're right. I mean, restaurants, all the service industries are just going to continue to struggle through that. Yeah, I don't think this is a license to just go out and buy anything. I like the casinos. I think people are going to be traveling a lot. Maybe the Expedias. Uh, oil companies I do like. I mean, they're so depressed. I mean, companies like Devon, which we recommended, it went as high as 40 before you know coming down. I think we sold it at a loss. You know, We limited our losses on that one. But, if, but when you look at it, I think Devon is, is what, like 10 bucks. Nine yeah, bucks, give or take. You know? so, I think, I I think mean, it was looking, at 11 the other day, but yeah. It was, and Exxon pop. Geez. No one talked about the pop in Exxon because it's not really a big stock anymore, right? I mean, $200 million market, whatever it is, to, it's not, that's not a big market cap yeah. anymore. <laughs> that would have been the highest market cap company 10 years ago, but today, no. When you have you know trillion, multi, $2 trillion valuations, basically. Well, we came pretty close to that with uh, you know Apple and, and Amazon. But yeah, do you think this rotation is going to continue? Because I don't know if it's so much where I could tell you, look, we're trading at 20 times forward earnings. Uh, and you should sell everything. I don't think so. I mean, you're seeing these cyclical names. And when I say cyclical and, and you know, the return to value and small caps, small caps are, are starting to outperform, which is amazing. They haven't outperformed on the way up, which they always do during, you know, economic recoveries or big rebounds like we saw. Now we're starting to see that. Uh, do you see that rotation continuing? Are you, you, do you think that, hey, you know what, the AMDs or, or, yeah, Nvidia's or these these you know high flyers and maybe even like the Pelotons and things like that. It, you know, are the fundamentals really going to change now from a vaccine? Are people going to order less Pelotons? I don't know. Maybe, but I, I just you know, it seems like to me it's going to be more of a shift in capital than an entire market collapse to me. But I could be wrong. What are your thoughts? No, I think I think it's, it'll be uh, stock specific. I mean, like uh, Site Centers is a previous portfolio holding for us mm. um, has uh, great shopping centers, uh, anchors and locations, they targeted like a hundred thousand, uh, annual yeah, income high end, well, in, in high yeah. end areas. And, uh, their yeah. stock is, is rebounded really nicely. Still, still depressed, obviously, but you'll start to see, you know, if, if the vaccine and things continue to go in, in our favor and people are going to go out to quote unquote normal, you know, there's no reason not to transition into sites like that, into companies like that, that, that makes total sense. Yeah. I'm not on board yet with, um, all the stay at home, um, you know, I go to a, I go to the gym at my apartment, so I don't go to a specific gym. I wouldn't have any problems doing that, but I don't know that I would rush back into like, I haven't touched Peloton. I think it's a hilarious story. I, I missed the move, but I couldn't imagine like everybody just selling their Peloton and going right back to the gym right away. No, Maybe I'm wrong on that. No, it's just so, about new orders that people in the start fangs, going to the gym and stop purchasing. The know, things outside of gym. Netflix, uh, but your Facebook, uh, Apple, Apple, Amazon, Google, um, I, if they pull back, I'd look at that as buying opportunities again. I've talked about that in the past on the political side, on e-threats, but those companies are just so massive and so powerful and their margin, I mean, no. I, so I don't think there'll be a huge rotation out of all the popular names, but yeah, it'll be stock, stock specific. And uh, a little plug here, the uh, pick and CRA that goes out today is is benefiting from that. Yes, yes. If you're a cursory research, I like manager, how I did that, Frank. Yeah, that out. was actually a good transition. I worked hard <laughs> on this name. It's gonna surprise you when you get it. It's a small cap, and usually we stick to large cap income generating stocks. Some of them and you can have dividends, uh, but this small cap was too good to pass up. It has a massive growth prof profile and is trading much cheaper than the overall market. And this thing, I really truly believe, is, is going to take off. So uh, I'm very excited about that pick, and I think you'll be excited. So we do a video of all those as well. So. Uh, yeah, those are video newsletters, guys, where you see the research, you see me bringing up sites and stuff, so that's cool. That was a great segue, Dan. You're getting, Thank you. Being, uh, you know, you're being, uh, getting to be a professional at this already, huh? Trying to help us out here. <laughs> well, listen, man, I want to thank you for coming on, talking on topics. Uh, the, the politics is going to be interesting, remember? 
You don't have to email me, frankersresearch.com, <laughs> but uh, that should be pretty cool. But again, uh, all this relates to your investments, guys. We all have our opinions on politics. And again, sometimes it goes crazy when you talk about the far right or the far left, but I think most of us are in the middle. Yeah, we want this to play out okay. We want this to be a, a fair election. Uh, it matters. It's going to matter tremendously for your portfolio or how we position ourselves. And you know that Senate race coming up is going to be huge, huge, huge in Georgia, right, Daniel? I mean, that, that that's, uh, you know, for me, I have that... Uh, top priority. I mean, that's not factored into where stocks are right now. I mean, th- there's no, like, that's not factored. There's like a 0% chance of uh, the Republicans losing both of those races right now based on where the market is trading, I have to say, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, everybody's quick to call the presidency and everybody seems content to call the House Democratic and Senate Republican. And yeah, I just, I, I don't think that's the case depending on uh, all the screwiness and the counting that's going on. But yeah, we'll see. No, it's great stuff. All right, Dan, thanks so much for coming on. And guys, uh, I want to finish with this. I'm getting a lot of questions and emails uh, about Curzio One. That's our premier membership uh, that we open up only once, and that was last year since we uh, you know started this company. We only have about 40 subscribers, and it's our most inclusive – uh, membership, getting access to all the products and services that we publish now and everything we publish in the future for free. You also get beta issues of our new products, which lets you uh, give us feedback on what you want to see out of these products. Uh, it's a great benefit. It's a great service, but that's not really what Curzio One is about. Curzio One is about a, a network uh, of of people. When I look at guys like Scott Cohen from Rap, uh, from Rap who's basically invested in companies, very wealthy person. Marin Katusa, Jeff Phillips, Rick, well, they all have their group of investors that they get into certain deals. And a lot of those deals, sometimes I, I'm able to pass them on if they're large enough to uh, Crazy Adventure subscribers. I think we're going to have one or two coming up soon. And other deals are very, very small that I can invest in personally that you know, with this group, I'm able to share because it's that much smaller. But you know, being able to meet you in person uh, and having that group and the ideas that come across my desk, especially now in the security token space, uh, are going to be incredible. But a lot of you have been asking about it. We're sending uh, another offer out again. I don't know when it's going to go out next. It's not a sales pitch. We don't do this often. I don't. I want to keep this group exclusive because these are the people that I plan to go out to dinner and meet with when I'm traveling a lot. And uh, you know, you have my personal phone number and everything with this membership. But if you're interested, let me know. It's only going out to 160 people. To put that in perspective, we uh, send information out almost on a daily basis to 70,000 plus. I think this podcast is getting downloaded uh, over 125,000 uh, downloads per month. Uh, this is only going out to 160 people. If you want information on this, it's usually for people who already own a bunch of our services. We take the money off of everything that you paid, and then you pay the difference. That's how it works out. But we're actually going to open it up in the next couple of days, uh, and it probably won't open up to next year. Every year that we open it up going forward, it's going to cost more and more and more. So uh, it's a cool service. It's not for everyone. It is our most expensive service, but it is you know access, you know just premier access to, to basically all of my contacts and uh, – so far, I'm sure that those people who are already in it really love that membership. It's really, really cool. And again, you can have access to, to a lot of pretty cool ideas that are very small, $20, $30 million mark caps that I can't share in the newsletters and stuff like that. We're just not allowed to. Uh, these are some of the things I get. And not all of them work out, but some of them have worked out tremendously for me. And these are the ideas I'm sharing with that group of people. So if you're interested, send me an email, frankcursorresearch.com. We'll make sure you're on that list. But right now, it's only going to 160 people. That's it. And I think there's 40, maybe 43 total members uh, and I like keeping that group pretty small. So if you're interested, just send me an email. And last, not least, be sure to go to our Curzio Research YouTube page. I've been saying it a lot, but Daniel and I, you can see both of us here. We got the whole entire studio set up. It's really cool. Daniel, say hi again. Yo. There he goes. Different camera views. We could bring up the uh, uh, everything that we're talking about. We could bring a, 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 on my desktop if we're looking at a research report. So yeah, this is state-of-the-art stuff. You'll see the quality of the videos. You'll see the lighting. We have lights. We have the best microphones, the best cameras. Mevo is every place. We're going to put up whiteboards. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have guests coming in the studio. And we're being researched just like uh, with, with T-Zero. Uh, just the guests that that are, are you know reaching out to us and – you know, we're reaching out to them as well because of you and how big this podcast is getting. You know, the quality of those guests is pretty amazing right now. It's really exciting stuff. So doing the video, we're getting a lot of compliments. We did a last one, uh, which was the first one, but the last last week with uh, Andrew Horowitz. And yeah, you'll see the video quality is amazing. Everything is cool. And you get to see us. And I just think it's a little bit more engaging. So if you want, go to our Curzio Research YouTube page. Be sure to hit subscribe. This way you know when that's coming out at all times. It might come out a tiny bit later than the overall podcast. But 
And you can also be sure to like it or not like it if you want. Let us know what we could change, what we could make different because uh, we're excited here. We paid a lot, a lot of money to build this studio and uh, I'm excited to finally launch it because it's been in the works for a while and now it's a lot, a lot of fun. So guys, questions, comments, I'm here for you, frankcurzoresearch.com. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate all of your support. You have no idea. Happy Veterans Day. Uh, you know, just uh, amazing. Just amazing that, you know, it gets lost in politics sometimes. Uh, people are so pissed off at the end of the day. We do live, truly live in, in the greatest country on earth. So it's awesome. And, and that's thanks to all veterans. So thank you so much. And I'll see you guys in seven days. Take care.